Someone say amen. amen. It is also on the monitors as well. And so the Bible it reads, Thus said the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Neither let thy mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches. Let him that glory, glory, glorieth, glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me. Look at what God wants us to do. He wants us to understand and knoweth him. That I am the Lord which exercise loving kindness, judgment and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. I want to teach tonight from this subject, knowing the characteristics of God. Knowing the characteristics of God. We need to know God. Not just hear about Him, but know Him. And so I'm going to just point out some characteristics about God. I know I can't do all of that with an amount of time. And so I'm just going to point out some of those things tonight. And so let us pray as we ask God to help us to receive this lesson tonight in Jesus' name. Father God, we thank you for the reading of your word. We thank you for allowing us to be in your presence one more time. For this is the day that you have made. We shall rejoice and be glad in it, O oh God. Father, tonight I pray, let the word of God be in our ears and Lord God in our heart. That God, what we receive tonight, we digest it. That Lord God, it be pleasing, Lord God, into your eyes because we have applied what we have heard. Let us not just be hearers, but doers of thy word. Father, I pray tonight, give us revelation, I pray. Give us interest and understanding and clarity. Touch your vessel right now as I give the word. Father, some may be tired and sleepy, but when Lord God, will you shake it off of us, oh God, in the name of Jesus. I want to shake off that sleepy and slumberness so I can hear the word of God. Father, this is nourishing for my bones and for my name, oh God, and for my life, oh God, for me to walk up right before you, oh God. Without your word, I cannot live. Without your word, I cannot Lord God, survive. So I pray right now, bless the saints that God when they leave here, they can all be able to say, it was good that we were in the house of the Lord. We give you glory, honor, oh God. We bind every spirit of distraction, everything that comes to take away the seed. We bind and rebuke it in the name of Jesus and we cast it down and we forbid it to operate and we release the power of the Holy Ghost. Protect us tonight, Jesus. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Clap your hands up to God. Somebody just open up your mouth just real quick. Somebody shout out hallelujah. hallelujah. One more time. Hallelujah. hallelujah. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Amen. Knowing the characteristics of God. I just didn't say this and that as well, but uh, also I was, when I was talking about teachers, just want to plug that in as well. That if you are going to be involved in any type of ministry, we want you to be at leadership classes. So we do have leadership class this weekend. So everyone that wants to be involved in ministry here, please be at those classes and also to the couples, only to the couples uh, this weekend, right after that leadership class, I'm just going to be meeting with all the couples. So we want everyone that's married, has been married, if you're 70 years and younger as far as you're married, we want you to be here. So come on to, to this weekend for that, uh, that class. Amen? Amen. So tonight, the knowing the characteristics of God, knowing the characteristics of God. As I said, many people may say that they feel that they know God. Uh, me, someday, I know about God. But I don't want to just think that I know about God. I don't want to just hear certain things that people say about God. But I really don't know them from myself. The only way that you can know more of God is that you have to know him by what? The word of God. Amen. This is the only thing that God has given us to be able to know who he is and what he desires and what he likes and what he dislikes. It is the word of God. So if you want to get to know who God is, you have to search the scriptures, not get it off of Google, not get it from some false prophet or false preacher. 
Not trying to say and figure it out yourself. But you need to know from the word of God. God's word is in there for us to learn of him. This is his communication, not only with prayer, but his communication to mankind. Mankind to let us know what he desires, what he, who he is, what he wants, and what he wants from you, how he wants you to live and to walk, how he wants you to be married or in your marriage or to raise your children. Everything about God, God is all in this word. All God is all in this word. That's why the Bible says, in the beginning was what? God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And so all of this, when you talk about God's Word, you're talking about God. So you can't separate God from His Word. And so I want to talk to you tonight about the characteristics of God, or knowing the characteristics of God. So I want you to write some of these things down so that as we get through it, then you'll be able to go back to it, uh, to be able to go over it, or maybe to teach someone else. But we know, we all we know certain things about God. You might have things that you might have heard or that you have read. We know that there is only one God. Amen? Amen. Amen. There is only one God. We know that, that God manifested himself in the flesh or came in the flesh. Amen? Amen. 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 We know that God's name is Jesus. Amen. Right. Amen. We know that God's name is Jesus. I remember asking someone. This question, I said, what is God's name? They said, God. I said, well, no, that's not true at all. God's name is not God. That's like calling you, if you are a man, I say, well, what's your name? Man. His name is not man. This man has a name. Amen? Amen. That's who he is. That's what he is. He's a man. So when you talk about God, that's who God is. God is God. That's who he is. He's a God. He's God. And so if I say to you, I say, well, what is your name? I can't say girl. Girl is who you are. But what is your name, girl? And what is your name, man? God has a name. And his name is Jesus. That's why we put emphasis on the name. That's why we put emphasis on the name to be baptized in his name. That's why we call on that name. We don't call on the name of God. We don't just say, I, I, plead, the blood, I plead the blood of God. I plead the no. Because there's many gods, many gods. Some people call Buddha God. Some people call Harry Krishna God. They call different things God. They call all of this foolishness that we hear today God. But there is only one true God. The question is, do you know the name of your God? I know the name of my God. I call that name when I am in need. I call that name when I'm worshiping. So if you, you don't know his name, then you can be worshiped and talking about anybody. That's why we don't get caught up in so much. I understand what it means. The titles, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. But what is his name? What is the Father's name? And what is the Son's name? And what is the Holy Ghost's name? name. It's all up in the scripture of what his name is. And so we know God. We know God has a name and his name is Jesus. And when you talk about God, the first thing that most people will say is that God is love. People will say God is love. How many believe that? Amen. Well, we can get twisted even with that. Because many people will say, well, no, God don't matter if I have this type of lifestyle because he is love. I can live this alternative lifestyle. I can have my boyfriend if I'm a man. I can have my girlfriend if I'm a girl. I can, I can have my, 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 my animal if I love it because I don't know if you know that, but people are involved in certain things as far as having animals as their wife or their husband. Oh, it's true because some man actually has a husband or a wife or you would say a spouse as a horse. What did he do? He changed his whole house around so the horse can actually lay in his bed. There are some people that have animals. You are people are today when you go up to a stroller and you say, oh, can I see your baby? And it's a dog sitting up in the stroller. People are getting attracted and been in love with animals. I don't care about no animal. Animal ain't got no soul. So if an animal dies, he dies. Like, who cares? I don't care. I don't care about no dogs if it dies. I'm not spending no money on no, uh, on no veterinary and stuff like that. Why? There's people that need to eat. Ooh, babies that need to eat. Y'all die. I don't care. You might not like me, and people on that Facebook might not like me too, but I, I'm not that type of person. Do I like dogs? Good. I'm cool with dogs. I like them, but I'm not sitting getting caught up in no animals. Definitely not 
thinking about looking at a dog, talking about, I think I want to marry you. The devil is alive. That is a spirit, people of God. But let me move on because I'm not talking about that. Amen? And so what am I saying? I'm talking about knowing God. And so when some people talk about God, they say God is love. Well, he is. He is God is love. That's why the Bible talks to us about John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's why God teaches us and shows us about an example of real love. Example of real love is when somebody will lay their life down for you. That's why the scripture says in John 15 verse 13, notice what it says, it says what? Greater love have no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. That's why I say to many people, young ladies, I say, hey, do you think he'll lay his life down for you? You said you are in love and you think he loves you. Will he lay his life down for you? I, I tell you a couple, tell you that many won't. Many won't lay their life down for people. They'll say, I love you, but when the time comes up, they'll be the first one. When gunshots go off, they'll be the first one ducking behind you. You'll be the first one as the shield, and then you turn around Say, I thought you loved me. I do love you, baby, but not just like that. And so their love will really be tested. And so love, love somebody that will lay down their life for a friend. Look at what the Bible says in 1 John chapter 4, verses 19. We love him because he first loved us. You would not even love God. I know we might say, I love Jesus and I, I love God, but you wouldn't love God if he didn't love you. You wouldn't even know nothing about love until God loved you. You wouldn't know anything about love until God loves you. We will all say that we are loved. We will all say that God loves us. Why? Only because we know that God loved us first. When I was a sinner, when I didn't, wasn't living right, God was still loving upon this sinner. When I wasn't doing, when I backslided, God still was loving on this backslider. He was loving me. He was doing everything. He didn't turn his nose up at me. That's what kind of love that I want. That's what kind of love that I need. How many can say they need that type of love today? I I need love that you don't turn your back on me, that you don't treat me wrong, that you don't look down on me, that you don't kick me to the curb when one day we're arguing, we're bickering back and forth, and you say, I'm leaving. No, I don't need that type of love. I need love that's going to always be there. I need love that will never turn his back on me, will never talk me out or talk about me. That's the kind of love that I need. The love that's going to stand by me with foot and tail, that we going to ride and die together. That's why we say, for God I live, and for God I die. So nothing will separate the love that I have between God. What shall come between you and your love with God? Shall it be money? Shall it be a relationship? Shall it be houses? Shall it be this? Shall it be tangible things? Shall it be your religion? Shall it be your own mindset? What you want? What will separate you from the love of God? What you need to say is nothing, Lord. Nothing is going to separate my love from God. And so I learned what love is because I mark. The perfect man. Who is the perfect man? Look at Psalms 37, verse 37. Notice what it says. It says, Mark the perfect man. And behold the upright. For the end of that man is peace. And so who is the perfect man that we know? That is Christ Jesus. And so if you need an example, that is who you ought to look for. And so tonight I want to point out some of the important things about God that we need to remember. The reason why you want to remember this, because if you remember certain things about God, there are certain ways and certain thoughts and certain things you will and will not do. Hear what I just said. When you know more about God, there is a certain way that you will live your life. You get what I'm saying? If you don't know about him, then you'll do all things just all willy-nilly and be thinking that he's cool with it. And when you find out, you'll say, I thought you, you didn't like me doing this. And he says, no. But obviously you didn't know about me. Amen? That's why you would say with couples, I talk to the couples, I say, well, get to know your wife. Get to know your spouse. And, 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 and Bishop, I used to tell us, study your wife. Study, brothers, hear what I'm saying? Study your wife. 
What do they like? What do they do not like? How are they in certain situations? Study them so that you will know more about them. That is who God has put you over. That is who God has made you, uh, 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 put you over them as far as that being their headship. Cover or study your life. You want to know more about them. That's how God, God knows everything about the church. He knows everything about the bride. He knows what we like. He knows the things about us. So we are to what? Study God. We are to know more about him. And so that way, when you know more about him, you won't be just hidden and missing. You hear what I'm saying? You won't be hidden and missing. You will be able to say, well, no, I know he don't like that. Which means it will straighten up the way you live. It will make your walk with God more perfect. It will make you look more right in God's eyes. You, you God will look at you and say, I'm pleased with your way. I'm pleased with your walk. I'm, I'm pleased with what comes out of your mouth. And I'm, I'm pleased with where you go. And I'm pleased with how your conversation is. I'm pleased with who you hooking up with. I'm pleased with these things. Why? Because you know who he is. And you know what he likes him. And you know what he does not like. And you know that if he loves you. And you know what will bring you closer to him. Amen? Amen. Which is why the Bible says to us in Jeremiah. That's our scripture text. I'm going to read it one more time. Notice what it just says. If you could put it in NLT for me. Starting at verse 23. Look at what the Bible says in Jeremiah chapter 9 verse 23. In the New Living Translation. This is what the Lord says. Don't let the wise boast in their wisdom. Or the powerful boast in their power, or the rich boast in their riches, because we know that that's what happens. But those who wish to boast should boast in this alone. Look at the code now. that they truly know me and understand that I am the Lord who demonstrates unfailing love and who brings justice and righteousness to the earth, and that I delight in these things. I, the Lord, have spoken. Amen? So let's look at these four points real quick. I'm going to try my best to get through it quick tonight. So number one, God is mercy. God is mercy or merciful. God is mercy and merciful. Let me give you the definition of mercy. Compassion or forgiveness shown towards someone whom it is within one's power to punish or harm. Notice what I just said. Compassion or forgiveness shown towards someone who it is within one's power to punish or harm. Every last one of us will be able to say that we should have been punished. Every last one of us will be able to say that you should have been harmed or you should have been dead or you should have been on drugs or you should have been abandoned or you should have been not here today but by the mercy of God you still sit here today. It is by the mercy of God that you are here today. It is by the mercy of God that you're breathing right now. It is by the mercy of God that you are still alive in your right mind today. I don't know about you but it was not it was not God that that was will for you to actually be here. But the mercy of God allowed you to travel in your car and no one, no other car hit you. You were not in an accident. I know some of these crafters go around and they do what? They they, they, they play the seed upon these grass up, on the, up, up in, the, in the sugar cane fields. But could you imagine one of those little crop dusters falling on your house or on your apartment where you live? You might think it's not a coincidence, but it's not. It is the mercy of God that you are made to go to sleep at night and lay your head down peacefully and no gunshot has gone through the window. No plane has fallen upon your house. Somebody ought to thank God for his mercy. Thank you, God. For your mercy. So when you think of God, you might as well say, he's mercy. He's merciful. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4 through 5. Notice what it says. But God, who is rich in mercy. What does that mean? He got a whole lot of it. When God is rich in his mercy, that means I got a whole lot. I never run out. I don't run out of mercy. I got it. I got so much of it just pouring out of me. What does that mean? I'm just all mercy. When you talk about me, I'm just mercy. That's who I am. That's who I'm made of. That's who God is. He's just mercy. Who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us. Look at verses 5. Even when we were dead and sins had quickened us together with Christ. By grace he are saved. How many just thank God for even for grace? Amen. 
So notice the scripture like Psalms 86. I'm going to give you some scripture so you can write it down. Some of these things you can go back to and encourage yourself when you have those tests or those trials. Just begin to say, well, wait a minute, God. I'm, begin, I'm going to go back and appeal to your mercy. I'm going to appeal back to your mercy. Psalms 86 verse 5. Notice what it says. For thou, Lord, art good and ready to forgive. Notice what he says. And ready to forgive. And plenteous in mercy unto all them that call upon thee. What does that mean? That you have to do what? And ready to forgive. God is ready to forgive you. And he has so much mercy that he wants to give it to you, which means you have to receive or take that mercy. Many people might say God is merciful or God is mercy, but are you want to receive the mercy that he has? He has plenty of it, but are you willing to receive what he has for you? Everybody walks around and say, God is merciful. God is so merciful. Yes. Yes, he is. But have you received that mercy? Have you gotten hold of that mercy? Let me explain it to you like this. Think about a court system, people of God. Think about a court system. I'm going to think of it like this to try to give you an understanding. There's sometimes when people are in court and they have maybe going to do maybe 60 years but to life. But they were doing what? A plea bargain. The plea bargain is this. If you confess that you did wrong, if you confess, heard what I just said, if you open up your mouth and confess that you did wrong. I'll give you a plea bargain. We don't know what that plea bargain is going to be. But in God's eyes, he says, if you confess your sins and say that I am a sinner and that I'm wrong for the way that I've been living, I will give you a plea bargain. What is it, God? My mercy. My mercy will not allow you to be what? Total damnation. My mercy will pull you out of hell. My mercy will allow you to walk free. My mercy will allow you to see another day. This is what it is. So think about a court system. We all should be what? In hell's gates and fire. But God says, I'll give them mercy. But you got to what? Appeal to that mercy. That's say, God, I'm sorry. Forgive me. I was a liar. I was a fornicator. I was a adulterer. I was a disobedient. I was rebellious. God, I was on drugs. But let me appeal to that mercy. Let me have that mercy. I need that mercy so I can go away free. Understand this, that we live a life and God never tells us how long we're going to live. So you have a shelf life, which means you will only be on the shelf for so long. So God gives you time and time and time. Within that time, you're going to have to face judgment one day. And he's going to ask you, did you appeal to my mercy? My mercy was there for you to appeal to, but you never took it. Don't just talk about God as merciful, but why don't you appeal to that mercy? Get a hold of that mercy. Don't just stand there and say he's merciful, but say, God, I need that mercy. I need your mercy. I need your mercy because I should be out of my mind. I should be going out of my mind. I should still be drinking. I should still be in the club. I should have had some disease. But thank God for his mercy. Come on, open up your mouth and thank God for his mercy. Now, thank God requires us to be the same way he is. Which is why he says to us in Luke 6, verse 36, Be ye therefore merciful, as your father also is what? Merciful. Look at Luke. Pull it up for me, sis. Luke chapter 6, verse 36. Be ye therefore merciful, as your father also is merciful. Amen. We must be merciful because God gives us new mercy every day. Do you know that you don't get any leftovers mercy? You don't get any leftovers mercy from yesterday. When you woke up this morning, you got new mercy. New mercy. How many like, how many like new stuff? Anybody like new stuff? I love getting new cars and stuff. That new car smell. Or when you come into a house, there's a new house smell. The carpet is new. Anybody like that? I'm like that. You like that new smell. You got them clothes on it. You know it. I don't know about you, but new clothes smell on you different than old clothes, don't it? That new clothes, I don't know, it does something. Maybe it's just me. But when you got something new, it sits upon you a certain way. And everybody can say, that must be new. Yes, it is. And you like it? Thank you so much. And you start putting your little model. You know how that goes. Yes, it's new. Some of us get carried away. We keep the cat the tag so we can show people how much it costs. That devil is alive. Pull that cab off. Because nobody care about all that. We understand it's new. I can see it. I can still see the crease in it. It's new. Thank God. 
that you got something new. Amen? Amen. But this is what God lets us know. We must be merciful because God gives us new mercy every day. Every day I wake up, he says, here, I'm going to give you some new mercy. I didn't deserve it, God. No, you didn't deserve it. But here is some new mercy today. Because if I don't give you this new one, you was going to run out. So I thank God that I didn't run out. That he's going to say, I got more for that. I got more than in my back pocket. That ain't nothing. I got plenty of mercy for you. So every day I wake up, I got new mercy. Look at what the Bible says in Lamentations, chapter 3, verse 22 to 23. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. Hear what I just said. It is of the Lord. Matter of fact, let me take that back. Don't hear what I said. Hear what the Bible says. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassion fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. How many know that God is faithful? How many know that he is faithful? God is faithful. If you would, you would never have a depressed day when you knew that God was faithful. You would never have a depressed day if you knew that God was merciful. If you knew that God was faithful. People walk around, how you doing? I'm alright. You know my sugar's still high. How you doing? I don't know. But I'm going to make it. Stop all that foolishness and begin to look at how faithful he's been. Just look back over your life and see what he brought you through. Look back over your life See what he made a way out of nowhere. Let me get and say, you know what? Stop that. To God be the glory for all the things that he has done. I just want you to take the time right now. Somebody say, to God be the glory. God be the glory. Which is why he tells us, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. So we must never get to a point where we think we are so righteous. I never get to that place like I'm so righteous because the Bible tells us, look at it in Titus chapter 3 verse 4 through 5. I'm giving you a scripture. Look at it in the NLT. I'll make it simple for it. Look at what it says. It says, but when God our Savior revealed his kindness and love, he saved us not because of the righteous things we had done. There's nothing righteous about you. Not so righteous about you. Notice what it just says. And it says righteous things we had done. But because of his mercy he washed away our sins giving us a new birth and new life through the Holy Spirit. Which is why Psalms 103 verse 8 says the Lord is merciful and gracious. Slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. This is why sometimes people may get upset and they might say well pastor why has not God actually dealt with them yet. And God, what, Pastor, why has people not dealt with them? Why God ain't dealt with these type of people yet? Well, they'll maybe come to me and say, Pastor, you need to talk to them because they need to be dealt with. And you need to deal with them. You need to deal with them. And so what I've learned, I've learned from my from Bishop that he used to teach us and tell us, listen, if you're going to err, if you're going to do something wrong, err or do wrong on the side of mercy. Give people mercy. Give them a chance. Give them a benefit, a doubt. Why? Because when it comes time, I'm going to need that same mercy. So what am I trying to do as a pastor? I'm trying to see. I'm trying to learn from my bishop. If you're going to err, err on the side of mercy. So if God confronts me and say, why did you give him that mercy? I can then say, Lord, I was just trying to be like you. I was just trying to be merciful, just like you are merciful. And so when somebody says, well, why have they not? Why have they not been dealt with? Romans chapter 9 verse 15 says this. For he said to Moses, I will have mercy on on whom I will have mercy and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion so God will give mercy to whoever he wants to give mercy your mercy may be like this and somebody else may be like this but you can't question God saying why did you give him much I don't know but he is God so he'll give mercy to whoever he wants to give mercy so I just thank God for the mercy that he gave me somebody already died at the age of 20 somebody died at the age of 25 somebody died and just committed suicide and they were in school in high school somebody felt like hey there was no need to live and they took their baby and blew their brains out but I thank God that I'm able to see the age of 40 I thank God that I'm able to see the age of 40 some of us are 45 some 50, 55, 60 some getting up there to the 70s but you better thank God that you're able to see this day today be merciful to you not about your righteousness there ain't nothing you done tell your neighbor ain't nothing about you tell your neighbor you. It is all about his mercy. Come on, somebody. Clap your hands up to that. Thank you, Jesus. Which leads me to my second point. God is 
righteous. God is righteous. Amen. He is righteous. Notice I'm going to give you the definition of all of these things. Definition of righteous or righteousness. Someone that is morally right or justifiable, faultless, and sinless. Let me say that one more time. Someone that is morally right, justifiable, faultless, sinless. God is righteous or right, never wrong. You want to know more about God? Think about right things. So that's why I would say you can line up your life with the scriptures. Because if you know that you're doing something, ask yourself, you used to have these little bands, uh, what would Jesus do? Anybody remember that? Uh, you can figure out your life if you write. Uh, if you would ask God, God, would God do this? Uh, that's how you know if it's right or wrong. Uh, that's how you know, because God ain't doing nothing wrong. Uh, so if God said, you can say, well, God, uh, will you do this? And if you know for a fact God would not do that, you know that ain't right at all. So you can govern your life to be able to tell, am I doing what? right? Will God do that? Will God do this? Will he go against his word? If he told you that you need to repent, if he told you you need to be baptized in the name of Jesus, if he told you that you need to stop doing this and don't live shacked up, if he told you don't drink this and don't go there, don't curse, don't use profanity, don't swear, don't walk up like this and don't do that, don't go there, don't do that. If all of those things are wrong, then you need to be able to say, if I'm doing it, then I know God doesn't like what I'm doing. Because what are we trying to do? We're trying to be righteous. I'm trying to live a righteous life because my father God is righteous. He is a righteous God. He's a right God, not a wrong God. So that's how I'm able to line up my life to see if I'm in the right place because if God is right then I need to be doing right. And right is not a little bend over here. Right is not a little bend over there. Right is right. Understand what I'm saying. Right is not left and right is not just going this way. Right is right going straight. Let me put it to you like that. It's going straight. It ain't no bend and no curve. It is straight. It is a straight and a narrow road. It is the right road. It is the road of righteousness. That's how God wants us to live. He wants us to be right. Notice Psalms chapter 11 verse 7. For the righteous Lord loveth righteousness. What do you love God? He says, I love righteousness. His countenance do it behold the upright. This is why you need a mother. This is why I tell the young people you need a mother. Why? Because that mother will teach you to do what's right if she's doing what's right. This is why you need a father. Why? Because that father will correct you to do what was right. This is why you need a preacher. What is that preacher going to do? That minister will tell you from the word of God what God says to do that which is right. That's why you need a pastor. Why? Because that pastor will put things in order in your life to tell you if that's right or wrong. So that's why I need a pastor. I need somebody to tell me. Because my mother was telling me. And when my dad was around, when he was around, he would try his best to tell me to do what's right. So we all need somebody to tell us to do what's right. Amen. Right. Uh, we all need somebody to correct us, uh, to keep us on the straight and the narrow path. Uh, I need somebody to tell me when I'm right uh, or when I'm wrong. Uh, because if I continue to do what's wrong, uh, guess what I'm headed? I'm headed to the devil's hell. Uh, but I don't want to go there. Uh, I need God to tell me what's right uh, and what's wrong. Uh, tell God right now, Lord, tell me what's right uh, and tell me when I'm wrong. Uh, that's what type of preacher. Uh, that's why I say don't muzzle the preacher. Uh, don't tell me what I can and cannot I preach. Don't tell me how long I need to be on some subject. Don't tell me that, hey, you've been on this subject for a long time. Don't you understand if I'm on that subject, then God is trying to get us right. If God is trying to get us right, that means he's trying to put righteousness in our lives. So what am I going to say to the preacher? Preach, preacher, and tell me when I'm wrong. Preach, preacher, and tell me if I'm doing it right. Preach, preacher, and tell me if I'm not doing what's right. So I will know what God wants me to do. Uh, clap your hands up to that. So go to Matthew chapter 5 verse 20. For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed. Listen just what I just said. Notice what Jesus is saying. For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed. That means go beyond. The righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. The Pharisees and the scribes were religious people. In our day, they would be people like this. I go to church. I read the Bible. I know the scriptures. 
I frequent the tabernacle all the time. I'm always in the temple. You can never catch a Pharisee outside of the temple, which means they're always in church. But notice what Jesus has said. Except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the fair scribes and Pharisees. They give time. They give offering. But he wants our righteousness to exceed things. Because all of the Pharisees and the scribes are on their way to the lake of fire. Those are the religious people. Very, very religious. You see them on Sunday mornings. You see them many times. Very, very religious. They only do things on what people can see them do. They only want praise. They want praise on what people can see them. But behind the scenes, how are you? Behind the scenes, how is your walk? Behind the scenes, does anybody have to remind you? Does anybody have to remind you to be in the house of the Lord? Does anybody have to remind you to do this and do that? Because he says, I want your righteousness to exceed what they're doing. Because they right now are dead man's bones. What I see them do, I don't recognize that. But he wants our righteousness to exceed. See that. Go beyond that. Push beyond that. This is what God wants us to do. To push beyond their, their righteousness. So I don't want to be religious. Because religion is man-made. I want to be right in his eyes. I want to be right. That when he looks down upon heaven, he says, I need somebody that's righteous. I need somebody that's righteous. I need somebody like Noah, who was righteous. I need somebody like Abraham. Abraham was righteous. I need somebody that was faithful. Faithful in all my house like Moses. He's looking for somebody. But how many saints that claim that they got filled with the Holy Ghost and baptized in the name of Jesus can say, Lord, I'm going to live right. I'm going to be righteous. I'm going to allow my righteousness to exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees and the scribes. Come on and clap your hands up to that. If you need help with that, you need to say, God, help me to exceed righteousness. And many times people may say, I'm seeking after God. Tell people, you need to seek after God. They say, I'm seeking, Pastor. I'm seeking after God. I say, that's good. How many would say that that's good if you're seeking after God? Amen. Amen. Just by show of hands. If you, if you say somebody say, I'm seeking after God, then anybody say, that's good, right? Amen. That's a very, very good thing to seek after God. But then this is what I say. We seek after God, but notice what the scripture says towards people of God. Look at Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. Look at what the Bible says. But seek ye first the kingdom of God. Now look at the and in it. And his righteousness. So just seeking after God, that's good. But you got to seek after his righteousness as well. So when you go after God and say, I'm going after God. I am, I'm going to go after God. I love God, Pastor. I do. I'm just trying to do my best to go after God. But I say, go after his righteousness as well. Yes, sir. Don't go, just go, go after his righteousness. Go after the things that God likes. Go after the things that are right with God. Go after those things that God wants you to do. Seek after, not only after the kingdom of God, but his righteousness. Mm. Amen? Amen? Amen. And if we want to be righteous, we must put off who we are or used to be. Hear what I just said? If you want to go after God's righteousness, then that means you're going to have to take off who you were. Because nothing about me was righteous. I don't know about you. Maybe you were holy and saved when you came out your mother's womb. But nothing about me was good or righteous. So what did I have to do? Take off of all of the things about me and then get up on him so I can become more righteous. So somebody, if you're holding on to the things that you used to do or the things that you think is right or the things that the ways that you like to do things, then that means you're holding on some of your righteousness. But your righteousness is not what his righteousness is. Matter of fact, he calls your righteousness filthy rags. So what does he say? Take those filthy rags off and let me give you some new rags. Everybody just say, I like new stuff. You like new stuff? Well, here's some new stuff for you. Put on God's new garments. Put on the righteousness of God. Put on his new garments. And I promise I promise you, you're going to look real good. I promise you, you're going to say, go ahead, rock on with your bad self, little sis. Rock on with your bad self, bro. Because that's that new righteousness shirt you got on. That's the new righteous shoes you got on. That's the new righteous socks you got on. You rocking that new line. What is it called, God? Righteousness. That's that new line. That line that nobody can pay for. That's that line you can't pay for. You can't go to the store for that righteousness stuff. Because that righteousness stuff is pretty. Stuff. It's real stuff. How many want to put on righteousness today? Clap your hands up to God if you want righteousness. So look at Ephesians chapter 
4, verse 22 to 24. I'm hitting it to close. Notice what it says. That you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is what? Corrupt. According to the deceitfulness, deceitful lust. And notice what he says. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And that you put on the new man. Notice what he just said. Put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. In righteousness and true holiness. Which leads me to the third point. God is holy. God is holy. When you take these things that I'm giving you tonight, you'll begin to know more about God and how you are to live your own life. You can line up. These are some, some, some small things that you can write down and have. Because it'll, if you keep these things in the forefront of your mind, then your life, I promise you, your walk with God will be a lot better than what it is. I have to know what he wants and who he is for me to be pleasing in his eyes. This is all that pastor is preaching. You got to know who God is and what he likes and who he is as a person, his characteristics, so that you can be pleasing in his eyes. So God is holy. Let me give you the definition of holy. To be dedicated or consecrated, sanctified, or set apart. God is holy. What is holy? To be dedicated or consecrated, sanctified, or set apart. This is who God is. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1 through 3. Notice what it says. In the year that King Josiah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon the throne, high and lifted up. And his train filled the temple. Above the, stood the seraphim, that means the angels. And one had six wings, and with twain he covered his face. Notice what it says. One angel, he had six wings and he was covering his face. And with twain he covered his feet. That same angel was covering his feet with his other wings. And with one twain he did fly. So here is this angel flying. His wings are covering his eyes, his feet, and his flying. And one cried out unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. First Peter chapter 1 verse 15 and 16. But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, be ye holy for I am holy. Notice what the Bible says in Psalm 69, 96 verse 9. Oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Fear him, fear before him all the earth. God is holy. Holy. When you know that you worship and live a holy, a, a worship a holy God, then there's certain things you will not bring before Him. That's why I come to tell you, there's certain things and lifestyles that I can't live before God because that God is a holy God. So don't try to put anything that's dirty and filthy with a holy. God. That's why he tells us the, that we are to be what? Sanctified. That's why he tells you, that's why you hear somebody tell you, you need to consecrate yourself. That means you need to set apart yourself for his personal use. He wants us to be holy because why? I can't mess with something that's filthy and nasty and dirty. So that's why, let me use you for a minute, sir, put that down for a second. So what that means is this, that if you are holy and you live a consecrated life or a sanctified life, that means Whenever God wants to use you, you are available to be used. So God says, I want to use you for this particular reason. He can pull you off the shelf and use you for that particular thing. Why? Because you've consecrated yourself. You're sanctified so he can use you. But if you're dirty and filthy, God doesn't want to touch that. Why? Because he's a holy God. He's a holy, a righteous God. So you cannot call God and say, God, I want you to be all up in my mix. If that mix ain't holy, if that mix ain't righteousness, if that ain't sanctified, I don't want to be involved in why? Because I am a holy God. That's why he'll push you away. Because I am holy and you need to be holy. First of all, to even be able to get to be holy, you need the Holy Ghost. That's why we tell you, the Holy Ghost will begin to what? Take that chunk out of you. It will change your mind, the way you live, the way you act, the way you walk, the way you dress, what you do, how you function, how you raise your children and your husband as a husband or as a wife, as a grandmother, how you are, all these things you would do because it's holy, 
That's why people say, go on with your little sanctified self. Go on with your little holy self. Go on, little holy roller. Go on, your little sanctified self. I, I know where you're going. You're on your way to church again. Again, that's why y'all all be up in that church. Y'all act like y'all so holy. But what you need to do is turn around and say, yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. We are holy. This is a holy place. At the holy people of God. Go to a holy place. We got the Holy Ghost. Because notice what the Bible says. You want to go to heaven? Okay. You want to see the Lord on that great day? Well, watch what it says. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14. Follow peace with all men. And what else? Holiness. Without which? No man. I just want to know if there's anybody. And that man is generic, meaning mankind. Nobody. I'll put it like that the way we talk. Ain't nobody. That ain't even scripture. Ain't. Ain't nobody going to see the Lord if you ain't living a holy life. Ain't, ain't nobody. Nobody's going to see God if you're not living a holy life. Yeah. To your neighbor, we got to be holy. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Let me show you how God gets down with his holiness. I think I'm going to have to stop right here. I'm not going to really get into that fourth point. Let me show you how God is. Notice the story of Aaron's sons. Let me show you how holy God is. And what God means about his holiness. It's probably going to be a awakening for you tonight. When you see this. I'm probably going to see some faces turn up like what in the world? Well here it goes. Now this is scripture. This ain't past the garment alright. Notice what the scripture is saying. You're about to see how holy and sanctified God really is. That he don't play about his holiness. And he ain't going to let nobody take anything of him. Amen. Look at Leviticus chapter 10 verse 1 through 7. I love scripture because when I learn and I look at scripture and read it. It begins to let me know more how God character is. And it let me know what I should not ever do in my walk with him. But notice what it says. Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu put coals of fire in their incense burners and sprinkled incense over them. In this way, they disobeyed the Lord by burning before him the wrong kind of fire. Different than he had commanded. So God wants a certain way. He wants a certain way to get the things to be done. But Nadab and Abihu decided, I'm going to do it like this. And I'm going to do this. Have you ever been there? I don't care. I'm going to do the way I want to do it. Anybody been there like that? Like that? Uh, come on, let's shame the devil. Remember, it's all right. We all one family. Amen. I don't care about what he said. I'm going to do what I want to do. Have you ever been like that with your boss? If your boss is here, don't raise your hand. But have you ever been like that with your boss? Have you ever said, I'm going to do what I want to do? I don't care about them. Have you ever been like that? Kids, have you ever told your mama, I'm going to do what I want to do? You might say it hit under your breath, but you ain't going to do it in their face. That's how I I'm standing up on the inside, but on the outside, I sit down. That's how it goes, right? I don't do what he say to do, but God has a certain way that he likes things, and he is a holy God, a sanctified God. So notice what God did. So fire, when they did this, they offered a strange, what? Fire. So fire blazed forth from the Lord's presence and burned them up. Whose kids are these? These are Aaron's kids. These are Aaron's kids. Aaron is the high priest. Aaron works inside of the church. Aaron works inside of the temple or the sanctuary. Aaron is also, you can look at him today as one of the pastors. Aaron is the one that is running the sanctuary. So Aaron's sons were burnt up. Burnt up, why? Because they offered strange, what? Fire. And so notice what said. So fire blazed forth from the Lord's presence and burnt them up and they died there before the Lord. His sons died. And now notice what Moses, look at Moses. Then Moses said to Aaron, this is like Bishop talking to me. Then Moses says to Aaron, this is what the Lord meant when he said, I will display my holiness to those who come near me. So if you come near to God with strange worship, with a strange unsanctified life, with a life that's not consecrated, if you come before God and you in sin, in the Old Testament, he will kill you. In the Old Testament, you can die immediately. So what does God do? I'll give them a little mercy and grace to get it figured out. Because at the end of this thing, if you ain't holy, I'm going to kill you. 
If you're not holy, you're going to die. And so what does he say? We just read it without holiness. No man shall see the Lord. And so if you ain't going to see the Lord, you know that you're going to see your cousin, the devil. And so I ain't trying to see him. I want to see the Lord. Amen. How many want to see the Lord and not the cousin devil? The devil is alive. I don't want to see him no way. So notice what it says. This is what the Lord meant when he said, I will display my holiness to those who come near me. I will display my glory before all the people. And Aaron, notice what it says right here. And Aaron was silent. I don't know about you, but when God says something and does something, it makes your mouth say, be quiet. That's how I used to be when mama get red and dad got big old chest and big arms. I used to be what? Silent. Why? Because I know he will kill me. I know mama, when she get mad, she will kill me. That's how I was raised. I would get real silent. So notice, his sons were killed. Aaron's sons were killed and he was what? Silent. Which means he didn't come around talking about, what you do that for? Anybody ever been there? What you do that for? You better be quiet before he heals you. That's why I come to tell you, that's why there's order in the house of God. Why are we doing this? And why are we doing that? And who he think he talking to? And I ain't trying to do that no way. And who he think he calling? And what he think he is? I'm not trying to do that no way. Because when God demonstrates his holiness and how he wants done things done in his sanctuary, then you're going to find out what kind of God we serve. And so notice what it says. Then Moses called for Michelle and what as a fact and Aaron's cousin, the son of Aaron's uncle, Yazeel, and he said to them, come forward. Now notice what Moses is doing. He said, listen, y'all, y'all come forward and carry away the bodies of your relatives from the front of the sanctuary to a place outside the camp. Why are they doing this and Aaron ain't doing this? Why are they about to go have the funeral and do the burial? But Aaron ain't saying nothing. Aaron is still sitting there silent while his sons are dead. And Moses says, come and get the, the, the armor bearers. Come and get them. Come and get the pallbearers. And the pallbearers come, lift up his body and take him out. But Aaron cannot go with them. Notice what the Bible says. So they came forward and picked them up from their garments and carried them out of the camp just as Moses had commanded. Go to the next verse. Look at what it says. Then Moses says to Aaron and his sons, Eleazar, and Ethamar, look at what it says. Do not show grief. Notice what he said. Moses is telling them, don't you even cry. Don't you even act like you sad because I just killed your boys. Don't you act like you want to say something out of your mouth. You know how that is when you want to say something but you can't say something. When you know you want to say something but you can't say something. And your demonstration is a, your demonstration is and your mama said, I'll give you something to cry about. You better not say nothing. Anybody ever been there? When you got beat so bad, the mama said, I wish you would say something. You better not even let a tear fall down. And you're standing there, but you're about to shake. And you're sitting there saying, Jesus. And the mama said, you said, Jesus, but you better not say nothing. Daddy is saying, you better not say nothing. Then Moses says to Aaron and his sons, Eliezer and Ethamar, do not show grief by leaving your hair uncombed or by tearing your clothes. Because when you did that, you were grieving. You were sad and you were by angry or you were hurting. If you do this, notice what he said to Aaron and them. If you do, you will die. And the Lord's anger will strike the holy community of Israel. And however the rest of the Israelites and the rest relatives may mourn, but notice what he said, everybody else may cry, but your mourning, or your crying, you bet not to, may mourn because the Lord's fury, destruction of Nadab, and Abihu, so what is he saying, you bet not do anything, verse 7, but you must not leave the entrance of the tabernacle, don't you even look like you want to leave church, don't you even look like you want to go out there, or you will die, for you have been anointed with the Lord's anointing oil. So they did as Moses commanded. So when you're sanctified or you're set apart or you're living a holy life, there's certain requirements that are going to come with that. That means when God says something, that's what he wants you to do. When he tells you to stand still, that's what he wants you to do. When he said be holy because he is holy, that means he's set apart. That means he's sanctified. That means he's consecrated. That's how he wants you to be. Not like everything else that's in this world. You're got to be holy. Tell your neighbor we got to be holy. Tell your neighbor we got to be holy. When you find out the characteristics of God, I'm closing right here. When you find out the characteristics of God, then you will begin to know what kind of God you serve. Yes, sir. 
That at the end of the day, all that Pastor did, all I gave you is information and knowledge of the word of God. At the end of the day, you have to make the choice. Do you want to serve this holy and righteous and merciful God? And my fourth point was, he's a God of judgment. So that meek and merciful Jesus, baby Jesus, that you run, that same God has another side of him like a coin does. The quarter has heads and tails. But when you turn that coin over, he's a whole other person. He's a whole other person. That same God is a God of judgment. And we'll talk about that next time. Let us stand. Amen. How many are so glad that you know more about God tonight? Amen. Amen. When you learn stuff like this, it helps you to walk upright before him. Amen? Amen. Amen. And so if you need prayer today, if you want to draw closer to God to help you, that way you can help you to live right, do right, and live a life that's pleasing to his eyes. The more you know of God, the more you can learn how to pray. That's what I'm doing. As a pastor, the more I'm figuring out and God is revealing certain things to me, it draws me or it pulls me to my knees because I'm saying, Lord, I see I'm still coming up short. If you're coming up short, you want to go to God and say, Lord, this is where I need help. If you're coming up short and you want to be saved and you want to be pleasing to God, you go to God and say, God, this area right here, I'm coming up short. I need help in this area right here. Amen. So if you're here today, those who have come to the altar, we're going to pray for you. We're going to ask God to help you. We're going to ask God to get you to where you need to be. Because we all got a long way to go. Amen. But even though we got a long way to go, do not stay stagnant where you are. You must go forward. If you stand still, you will die. So let's God ask God to help us. In Jesus' name. If you're here, let's lift up our hands unto God. And for those who are at the altar ministers, I wanted you to pray. There's people down here as well, so you can come on down in the name of Jesus. But let us lift up our hands up to the Lord. Father God, we thank you, Lord God. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your love and your kindness toward us. Father, I thank you, Lord God, for letting me know and giving me understanding how holy you are. Father, that you are a righteous God. And that God, you're full of judgment, God, at the end of the day. Father, I love you, Lord God, for giving me a chance to even hear this message tonight. But Lord God, for those who are upon the internet, Lord God, and listening to a lie, we thank you for teaching us today. I'm glad that I was here in the house of the Lord one more time. Father, it is the word that is going to save us. And if we don't know more about you and what you require, oh God, no man can say in this church that they have an excuse. Father, I pray that you're helpless. You're full of love and kindness toward us. I want to appeal to that mercy that you have so much of. Father, have mercy upon us today. Forgive us today, Lord God, and get us right where we need to be. God, I thank you for saints, Lord, that love you. Father, I pray, encourage them right now in their hearts. Father, I pray, minister to them when they go to sleep. Let them know that, that you're with them, God, and you want them to be saved. I pray, put your angels and cap around them, God. Touch their heart, God. We need to be convicted, oh God. Not condemnation, but conviction, God, that pricks our hearts to get right. I pray for those who are not able to make it. But I pray for those, God, that really have not made their decision and their choice to really live for you. We give you glory, honor, and praise. We thank you right now. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Clap your hands unto God in Jesus' name. Tell your brother and sister you're about to see them. If somebody needs to be baptized, the water is warm, is ready for you. We have towels ready to go. And you'll be here at the house of the Lord this weekend. Come on for the leadership classes if you want to be a part of ministry. If you want to be a teacher, we need you to be here. If you want to be a part of the ministry, but maybe you want to go higher, come to this leadership class. But to all of the couples, please be here for that session in Jesus' name. This is the start at 1 o'clock in Jesus' name. God bless you. We love you. We will have food as well. We love you. So if you want to go and see over there the, the, what we have built and what we have done already, what the, the, the people have done, why don't you go ahead and go into the classrooms so that you can see what we're doing in Jesus' name. God bless you. We love you. We love you so much. We know you that God loves you more in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.